Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time for another dispatch video. I am a guest at Retro World Expo. I'm doing a panel in a little bit and I thought I would just do a video where we kind of walk around and see what one of these shows is all about because not everybody has a retro gaming convention near where they live. And this one has really evolved a lot over the years. It's a ton of fun if you're in Connecticut where I am and we're going to walk around and see what we can find. Let's head in. Hey, look who I stumbled into here. This is Epox Box. How are you? Hey, doing great. How are you? So what do you like about coming to a retro game show? I know that's kind of, you, you've always had an interest in this, but of course your content is, is far more than that. Yeah, I, I love seeing the different ways that everyone can really get into their hobbies. Because as you mentioned, like I have my own focus on retro gaming as a side thing, but like this is all in on it. And so I get to take little ideas without having to be, you know, completely wrapped up in it 24 seven. And so I get to try to avoid spending too much money at these kinds of things, but usually come away with some good stuff. I have no room in my bag already, so that's how I get away with it. And Epos Vox, if you're not familiar with him, uh, you go by the streaming professor. Um, so if you're looking to learn how to stream things, he's your man. And you know, streaming retro is really hard, right? So how, what would you say is the, is no single best way, but what is your preferred way if you're trying to do a CRT and also do an HDMI? What's, what do you think is the best way to go? At this point, the best option is a, a scaler of some sort, the RetroTINK, open source scan converter. There's new ones coming out like the Pixel FX Morph. Uh, those are usually going to be your best bet. So you just need a way to split your analog signal or use a PVM that has analog video pass through and then run it to a scaler. There are still analog capture cards out there for streaming, but they are not great to work with these days. So the more, the easiest you can get it to HDMI in a way that's not going to add a bunch of weird processing, the better. And so there are so many great scalers on the market today compared to even just like three years ago that it's kind of the way to go. So it's gotten a lot easier. Yes. But you still need to watch this guy because you learn a lot. I've learned a lot from him and I'm still learning. So check him out at Epos Fox on YouTube. Now there's always some cool retro products we run into at this show. And this one I thought was pretty neat. This is called the Build Decade. And this is a kit that works with a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. And you make your own arcade. You can customize it if you want. So you can change out the marquee up here, which lights up. And it looks kind of similar to some of the pre-configured ones you can buy but this of course is a lot more interesting due to the fact that you can install a raspberry pi and run whatever you want on it this is going to be available at uh, thunderstickstudio.com for about 89 dollars it does not come with the raspberry pi you have to supply that one i've got a pile of them before they started running out of stock on them so we'll probably have one to play with here also of note and these are optional they have different control modules that you can get for it. So they really thought through a lot of this. So you've got like a little roller here. You've got a steering wheel. I'm looking forward to playing some pole position on that. And a couple of other controls for retro games. A lot of what you might see on one of those larger arcade things. And you can just swap those things out. I think this will be pretty popular. It's not all that expensive. There's a, a kit aspect to it. So you do have to build it. And I think a lot of uh, fun for kids and adults alike on this one. This is called the build decade and it should be out pretty soon. Now, one of the fun things about coming to one of these shows is you can kind of get your collection up to speed, and there are vendors all over the place. You can buy loose cartridges, things that are uh, more common, and then you've got some less than common things that you can find, like in uh, cases over here. And one of the things that I love about coming to these shows is that you forget about what the original boxes look like. They were such an afterthought back in the day. You'd get your birthday gift or your Christmas gift. You opened it up, you tossed it out. And somehow th those boxes, for me at least, bring back a flood of memories. And you have some original system boxes here. You'll see these all over the place. The price, of course, goes up the more complete the device is. But I have um, been slowly re <laughs> recollecting all the things that I once tossed out as garbage. And that's why they're so rare. So I'm with Joe, who might be familiar to a lot of you, because he's the man behind the new 8-Bit Heroes. It started as a movie, and now it's a full development environment for the NES. Tell us more about it. Yeah, correct. So uh, uh, basically, when I was an 8-year-old kid, uh, I was Mr. Nintendo, uh, and I... As we all were. Right, right. And uh, But for me, it wasn't like a passive thing. Like, I wanted to create. It made me want to create things. And so I, at the time, created uh, illustrations for the game I wanted to create and sent them to Nintendo of America. Uh, I sent them to Nintendo Power's address. Yeah. Uh, please send us the stuff I need to make my game, right? And of course they sent them back to me. Sorry, we can't take on some game ideas and it's heartbroken, whatever. 
those ended up sort of lost to time. 30 years later, when I found them, I was like, I'm a game developer. I can make that. So my uh, production partner at the time said, we should make that game for the NES. And you sh we should make a documentary about the homebrew scene and why people are making NES games, why you're making a NES game, all that stuff. So we made a film about it, and we were making our game. And over the process of making our game, we were making these little sort of tools uh, that would help us mine for the assembly data that we were creating and make it easier to develop. And by the time we were finished with that game, uh, we looked back and we said, oh my god, we have a tool that can make NES games, right? So uh, we put it out in the world and we said, hey, if people are interested in this, maybe we'll, make, we'll refine it and make more of a public tool. And that's what we did. That, that was the birth of NES Maker. Uh, and this is NES Maker right here? Yep. Uh, so it's not actually a disc. This is actually the, the software that comes with a copy of the movie. So we sort of, when we do, go to conventions, we bundle them as a pack. Um, you don't need that to get it. You can download it from the website. You can actually buy the software online. Um, but yeah, so then at that time, we took the game that we had created and we said, man, imagine if we had this tool when we started this project, right? So we cut off where we were and we made that game a prequel quest. And now we're working with the tools to make like sort of our magnum opus version of it, right? Um, so yeah, and now we got about 10,000 active users around the world making NES games. Making more NES games than probably ever existed. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. And we have it running on the computer here. We can just get a close shot of it real quick. Uh, my friend's gonna zoom in a little bit. So uh, tell us more about what we see on screen here. All right, so what you're seeing uh, right now, you're looking at sort of the object uh, management uh, uh, interface for the, the player object in this particular game. But on the left of the screen, You've got um, your different tools and your different uh, 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 your hierarchy of, of assets. So you've got like a pixel editor. Uh, the pixel editor works with uh, bitmap files so that you can make so you can make graphics in Photoshop or Paint, you know, whatever, and import them easily. But then it spits out the CHR data that the Nest needs, and it has little tricks in it that help you condense it down to the three colors that the Nest needs to see. Right? You've also got a script editor and input editor, so you're not like fumbling through the scripts to find your input for what happens when the left arrow key is down in the start menu. No, no, you can actually look at the input editor. I could actually walk through it a little bit. Sure. So um, you could actually like go to your input editor and you could say, okay, when I'm in the start screen and I press the left arrow key, I want to run a certain script and then I add it to the list. Heck of a lot easier than what it used to be. Right, and then when you're in the game state, now all this stuff is still assembly code. Like it still has an assembly code base. And if you want, you can get into the assembly code and you could write an engine from the ground up if you wanted and use this to organize your assets. But what's great about it is Nestmaker comes with about half a dozen templates. So I want to make a platform game. I want to make an adventure game. I want to make a maze game, whatever. Uh, you start with this basic sort of template and then you could build from there and get as far into the code as you want. You can really accelerate your learning um, because you can start to see how the assembly code links into what you've pre-programmed. Then you can really see so there's no limit really to. And, and uh, honestly, uh, I, I taught game development for six years um, and I watched how people used GameMaker and Unity and stuff like that and how they learned the programming languages like GML or, or the JavaScript uh, that Unity uses. Um, and, uh, and I tried to sort of implement where I could. I mean, the Nest is a whole different beast, right? But where I could, I tried to implement that kind of like, okay, how can people better learn this complicated assembly language? The best part is assembly is easy. Everyone's very scared by it when they see it because it's different. But it's actually easy. It's how it interfaces with the hardware that's hard. But Nestmaker takes care of that part. So you get to do the creative part. and You get to start like dipping your toes in the assembly. What happens if I change this value? What happens if I write these five lines of code? Rather than looking at... 50,000 lines of code and be like, I don't know where to start with this, you know? You can see how the code connects. And then how, do, and does it spit out a ROM when it's done? So it spits out a ROM, um, and you, when you hit export and test, it takes what you've done uh, with this, this front end tool and opens it up in uh, an assembler, opens up in Messin, which is, you know, they've, they've been gracious enough to allow us to include it with the software, which is awesome. And they've got great debuggers in that emulator too, which makes it great for development. Uh, then with one click, you can actually use one of these infinite NES Live's cart flashers and the cart and uh, make cart and 20 seconds later you can play it on actual hardware, put this right on your shelf next to Mar Mario and Zelda and Mega Man and all that stuff. You can become your own Nintendo, you can start cranking out carts and with your game on it and, uh... and... Here we've actually got a couple examples of games that people have created with the software. We're just shuffling out different ones throughout the day. Um, so yeah, these are uh, actual fully developed published games that are out in the world right now that you can purchase that, that you know, um, exist. People are also starting to publish Nestmaker games to the Switch and the Xbox. 
um, Steam, stuff like that, too. Where can people find all of this? Uh, the new 8bitheroes.com, or just Google Nestmaker, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Great, Joe, thanks a lot for showing us around. And of course, they've got a great selection of arcade games here, all the originals here functioning. This is the original Pac-Man here. Got Galaga, looks like it's taking a break here. Uh, Double Dragon, some of these are in better condition than others, but it's really fun to just play some of these games again and see them stacked up right next to each other. I used to go to arcades that look like this, where you had just hundreds of square feet of video games after video game after video game. And these, of course, are all free to play, including this one, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is one that was at my local Dairy Queen. When I was growing up, there were video games like this everywhere, the bowling alley, the Pizza Hut, and everybody had a different game. And there's something about the sound of all of these arcade cabinets just blaring away, mixing together, that really brings you back to the 80s. All right, I lost my cameraman, but I am here with my good buddy Bob from Retro RGB. How's it going, Bob? Hey, what's up, Lon? Great to see you. The show's been awesome, so it's a lot of fun here. It's always a good vibe here, and it gets better every time, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it's also really cool to see both a mix of new faces and people come back. And I'm like, oh, I remember you from last year, so it's always a good time here. We're, we're sort of local. We won't reveal our exact locations for security reasons. Um, secure, undisclosed, RGB look. We'll just say that we're within driving distance. I think that's fair. That's fair to say. And um, we've been coming to the show every year. It gets better and better. Yeah. What are you working on? What's the latest thing on Retro RGB? We've got a lot of content together. People can get your origin story, but what's happening now? I mean, I know this is a cheesy answer, but the past month or two, all I've been working on is getting people here. We have people flying from all over the world. Ronnie came from Lebanon. Artemio came from Mexico City. It was just, it's been kind of crazy getting this to work, but it's, that's, once this is over, I'll jump back in, and, uh, and I'm kind of doing some audio stuff soon, too, which is going to be a little bit interesting. Cause... You're a musician. People don't realize that about you, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I used to be, but uh, you know, the audio. The problem with audio is when you have a video comparison, you could show anybody a picture and you could see the difference. But audio, how are you going to do a comparison? What speakers are you listening to? What headphones? So it took a long time for me to figure out how to present that to people, and I think people are going to dig some of the audio stuff because all of our teamio's work with MD Fourier really changed the game because now we have actual analysis graphs to see. So, yeah, other than the Sega Triple Bypass for the Genesis consoles. There hasn't been much on the audio side, but we're going to change that. All right, so here you heard her here first. Audio is the next frontier, so you have to maybe have to add like A to the retro RGB, maybe. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's maybe, but uh, getting started is pretty cool. And the good thing is you can find stuff cheap, like a really good two-channel receiver. It's not like BVMs; you don't have to drop a thousand dollars. You can spend a couple hundred bucks and get really good audio. So hopefully, I'll be able to help people with that at some point. Excellent. Well, you certainly helped me, and I've spent a lot of money because of you. So it's uh, you're doing you're doing doing the Lord's work here. So. Keep doing you, Lon. I love your videos. You've, I, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, I wonder if anybody reviewed that. Lon reviewed it. Oh, at least I know I got a good recommendation now. Perfect. So, thank you. If it exists, I tried to do it. So, Bob, Bob, great to see you again, and we'll see you, I'm sure. We'll try to take a visit. We'll do a little collab at your place. Absolutely. I'll see you soon, Lon. Great. And they have some 8-bit tournaments going on right here. And what's great about this is that they've got the real CRTs. And the static on this TV is exactly how I remembered my Atari looking like when I was a kid. And check out this awesome replica of the Knight Rider kit car that's here. Let's have a talk with its creator. All right, I'm here with Bradley, who created this beautiful replica of kit. And I grew up with Knight Rider as a little one. I used to stay up late to watch it, I think, on Friday nights or something. Tell me a little about this car. Like, what went into this? Well, it's a 1983 Pontiac Trans Am. Uh, it's got a Chevy 350 engine. And basically, you just start with a regular Trans Am. And there's lots of different vendors out there that make the various parts like they have the uh, dashboard, the fiberglass itself is made by one person, and the steering wheel is somebody else, electronics, vice versa. So I built this car. You, could, you can technically buy them. Sometimes there's, there's vendors out there that will build these cars for people. But I wanted to do it myself, and I know a lot about mechanics and, and IT, so I decided to give it a go, and uh, here we are. And it, there's a lot of IT in here. You have Raspberry Pis driving the displays, a Windows 10 computer. It's yes, I do. I do. It's a Windows 10 computer. Two Raspberry Pis, one's running the scanner, the other one's running um, some of the demo elect electronics. And uh, the car actually talks. I can talk to it. I'm not doing it today because it's, it's in an expo and it's very loud and it's not really listening very well. But it, uh, I can actually say something to it and it'll respond. That's really cool. Does it have missiles? Not yet. 
Well, hopefully we can get those next year. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you for showing us around. It's a beautiful piece of work here, and I think something that a lot of Knight Rider fans will appreciate. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to interview me. Now, how, people, how can people find you? I guess you can book this car for different events and whatever. Uh, I, I, I'm not really doing that right now, but you uh, feel free to give me a follow. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Knight2000CT, and my website is Knight2000CT.com. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so that is going to do it for this trip to Retro World Expo. Normally, I spend more time here and I have a little bit more to talk about, but I've got to get on a plane and get over to the Space Center for the launch of Artemis 1. So we'll do more next year at Retro World Expo. But I have to say, this show gets better and better every year. So if you're in Connecticut, definitely check it out, because if you are a retro game fan like me, you could definitely spend a day or two uh, roaming around the halls here and finding a lot of stuff to be nostalgic about and perhaps find some new areas of retro gaming that you hadn't explored before. That's going to do it for this Dispatch. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht. Amda Brown. Matt Zagaya. And Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.